So, hello everyone. And uh, welcome to my topic. And today, I would like to talk about how to use uh, OpenStack, Kubernetes, as well as Hyper Container to build a real multi-tenant but secure container platform to run your NFA workouts. Okay, so I'm Hari. You can find me through this uh, GitHub ID and Twitter. I'm a coder, author, and speaker. So I'm not a member of Hyper and also the feature maintainer and the PM of Kubernetes. Many focus on the scheduling, seek node, and also maintain a Kubernetes Frank T project. Okay, so let's begin. When talking about NFV, the so-called network functions virtualization, I think um, it's actually originated from a so-called trades of telecom operators. It is according to um, a survey from Gardner that it is saying the traditional business of the telecom operator really grow in the past five years. While well, comparing to that, the non-traditional business climbed to 80% of the whole revenue, and some of them even reached to 15 to 20 percentage. And all of these so-called non-traditional business actually includes um, about four business models, including entertainment and media, M2M, cloud computing, and IT services. So if you Today, you go to the marketplace, you check out what the telecom operators is doing today, you will notice that they are doing the new business. But uh, the Gardner also found that uh, there are still new problems happens to this new business model. Uh, one of the most uh, severe problems is the so-called pain of the telecom network. It is mainly talking about that the network in the telecom operator company is always composed by some specific equipment and devices, and they have to follow strict protocol, which is quite different from what we are using today. And uh, it requires high reliability and high performance, but also requires high operation cost. And that's why this kind of problem actually result in some um, uh, bad things, including that uh, the long deployment time, of time cost of your new business applications and uh, a much more complex operation processes of your new business application. And you always have multiple hardware devices coexist in your data center because you need to handle it. And what's worse is a closed ecosystem because nobody can play very well, nobody can play very easy in this field. So if you say this problem in one setting, it is actually about uh, your new business model actually requires new network functioning. And that's why we need to have NFA. The core idea of NFA is that we are trying to use software to replace the hardware network elements in your data center. And this software should be able to run on any kinds of COTS computer. I mean, the normal computers, the PCs, the servers that you're in today. And these computers should be able to host it in any data center in all the world today. So that also reminds us the functionality of this kind of NFA actually should be able to first locate to anywhere most effective or inexpensive. That is what we are doing with the normal application today, actually. And second, they should be able to be speedily combined, deployed, relocated, and upgraded. That is also what we are talking about the microservice today. So you can see here the NFA is actually a modern kind of software, which is quite different from the traditional software, network software in the past few years. It should be more agile and it should be easy to deploy and uh, should be upgraded very fast. So that's why we say the NFA can bring us with something magical, like uh, speed up the time to market. It's very important for non-traditional business. And it's not like uh, the old days when you can just ship a big machine with a system software to a customer. It's not work today. And it also save us, save the cost to maintain the software. And what's more important, it can help us to encourage innovation, not a closed ecosystem anymore, because everything is now software, host on GitHub. That's good. I will give the user case about NFA today. It's very popular. I think uh, many people know about this project, which name is um, Project Clearwater. It is actually an open source implementation of the IMS system. Um, in, a in the past few years, this kind of IM system is always very complicated, which is composed by multiple layers, including control layer, application layer, media layer, which are composed by different kinds of physical machine and equipment. 
that in NF ray, this kind of IMA system has been transferred to pure software written by code hosted on GitHub. So the Clear Water project is actually composed by 10 software, 10 components on the GitHub. It's fully open sourced. Anyone sitting here can use Clear Water to build an IM system, to make a phone call, to make a video call very easily. So I will give you a small demo about um, the Clear Water project. So now we have the software. The software in NF is actually what we call the VNF, the virtualized network functions. So now we have VNF. The problem is how can we shape the VNF to cloud so now we can enjoy the benefits of the massive cloud computing system we are using today. You can see here that VNF actually loves the cloud, but um, actually we need to make a decision here. What kind of cloud I'm talking today? You know, today we have two kinds of cloud, the virtual machine or container. I think a lot of people may know the difference between them. The virtual machine, which is built by hypervisor, will have its independent guest kernel with full, op full operation system. But uh, compared to that, the container only has a uh, very thin layer to let read it, only including your software and your uh, binary and libraries, that's all, because it shares the kernel of the host operating system. So that's why we need to make this thing here, because you can see the container may be lightweighted, but there's some security problem in cont container you can see here. So today I will give you a comparison analysis uh, based on six dimensions here, including uh, service engineity, things like that. Okay, so let's begin from the first one. The service engineity, is it talking about the, the speed? We all know that provision a virtual machine took much longer time than a container, but why? It is most uh, caused by the hypervisor configuration, the guest OS, and the guest OS, the like guest OS with NFs, I mean, with VNFs, I mean the process management service, stuff scripts, they all will need extra time to deal with. But compared to that, provision the container is super fast because it's only about how to start a process inside the right namespaces and C groups. That's all, no other overhead. And that's why you can see from the picture, it is actually a test result from an uh, Intel paper. It is saying that the average start time of the key and virtual machine actually calls you about um, 25 seconds. Well, comparing to that, a container which contains exactly the same application only calls about 0 0.38 second. It's super fast. Okay, that's the agility part, which we can see here the container playing much better. So the second part is the network performance. Um, I think people may understand that uh, the virtual machine may have the poor performance if comparing to container. But today, I like talking about the network performance because for VNFs, for functions, actually the, the network performance played a much important role here. So for example, for throughput, according to the same paper from Intel, um, it's very interesting because um, the resulting package per second that a VNF is able to push through the system is stable and similar in all three runtimes. I mean, on the host machine, in a container or in a virtual machine. There's no much big difference. difference. And this test is being um, done by using a direct forward test, layer two forward test, and layer three forward test. They all show the same result. It is very interesting, and it's also the same with the network latency, because, um, for example, in direct forwarding, there's still no big difference in this kind of test. And uh, on, on the other hand, the virtual machine shows a little bit unstable here. Uh, which, I, which, according to the analysis, is caused by hypervisor time to process regular interrupts. And for layer two folding, also shows the same uh, results. And in this test, the container even shows some extra latency, which we think is caused by extra kernel code execution in C groups, which is unneeded in virtual machine. And again, the virtual machine shows a little bit unstable here, which you can notice in the, in the graph that um, uh, the maximum latency of the virtual machine is not stable, can reach a very high level. Okay, so for network performance, you can see that uh, there's no too much big difference between the virtual machine container and uh, the host machine. It's very interesting. And the last, and the third part is a resource footprint, and which is actually about the density you can deploy to your containers. So for virtual machine, according to the paper from Intel, uh, the KVM actually requires the average of about uh, 125 MB memory when booted. But compared to the other container, only require about uh, 17 MB memory. That's because uh, the amount of code loaded into memory in the container is very, very limited, it's significantly less, because it does not have to run a guest operating system. So that's the reason. And uh, that's why we say the container can be bring you with a much higher deployment density. It's because density is limited by the incompressible resource. 
that is uh, memory and disk. But for container, it does not need to even provision any disk. So all the density here is limited by the memory footprint, and that's why the container can play better here. Okay. So next part is uh, portability. And if you want to um, move the mach virtual machine from uh, one host to another, the most uh, simple way is using a virtual machine disk image. And uh, it is actually a provisioned disk containing the full operating system. And the, ma uh, the final disk image is usually contained by GB. But uh, what's worse is that you always need some uh, extra process for porting virtual machine, including the hypervisor reconfiguration, the process management service again. But compared to that, the container image we are talking about, for example, the Docker image, the OCI image specification. It is quite late weighted because it can be very small, just uh, like uh, your application binary plus 205 MB more. Because, for example, you can just uh, use a busy box image, you can use a um, RPI image, that's enough. And for Docker, it only gives you the new feature, the, the so called multi stage build for you to create any kinds of um, small deployment image for you, just to contain your application binary and a very, very small operating system. Okay, so that's why we can see the content image is very small and it can bring us with a better portability than the virtual machine, okay? The next part is configurability. And uh, I think a lot of people um, have experienced the configurability of the virtual machine, which I need to say is very complicated. There's actually no obvious methods to pass configuration to the application running inside the virtual machine. And I think you may know some alternative methods like uh, share folder, pull mapping, pass environment, but you can see here there's no easy way to do that, no user-friendly tool here. But uh, that is where container is doing very well, and uh, especially Docker, Rocket, things like that, and they all give us a very user-friendly control tool for you to do that. For example, to mount volume, it's very simple. To pass environment to application inside your Docker container, it's very simple. And uh, it provides us with more and more command line tools, arguments for us to use to control the management, to manage your persistent running inside the sandbox. It's quite different from the virtual machine. Okay. I think that's also why uh, Docker becomes successful today. The last but most important part is the security and isolation. Well, I need to say um, the virtual machine wins here because uh, it can bring you with a hardware level virtualization with independent guest kernel. Well, compared to that, the container, however, just ha is very vulnerable because it just has a weak isolation implemented by namespaces and same groups. It shares the kernel of the host machine, which gives you more possibilities to be attacked, like a jailbreak. And um, you have some way to reinforcement, to do reinforcement in these aspects, like uh, capabilities, libsecom, secure Linux. But you can find that if you do it by yourself, you can find that it is very hard to make decision, make this kind of decision. Like, for example, what capability do you think is needed or unneeded for a specific user container? It's very tricky to make this decision because you don't know what the user is running inside, you don't know what's the requirement of a user. So that's why I say and I believe that non cloud provider today allow users to run containers without wrapping them inside a phone blow virtual machine. It's a truth. Although I know there are a lot of reinforcement you can do, but I think nobody believes in that. Okay, so that's the truth today. And that's also another problem. We just want to keep clone native. I'm a member of CNCF Foundation, so I know it's very important to, to keep clone native. We just don't want to tolerate the slow startup time of the virtual machines. But at the same time, especially for the, for the NA3 deployment, we really care about its security because it's always in a multi tenant environment. We, never, we always worry about the noisy neighbors around us. Okay, so it's really tricky to make this decision here, and that's why we have Hyper. The basic idea of Hyper is actually trying to keep secure while keep cloud native because we're trying to make the virtual machine more like container instead of the other way. And uh, the idea of Hyper is actually originated from the container we're using today. I will use Docker, for example, here. It is actually composed by two parts. The first part is the container runtime, which is a dynamic view of your boundary and uh, um, of your running processes. In this example, it's a echo hello world, and it is running inside the namespace and C groups. Okay. And the second part is content image, 
which is actually the static view of your program, your data, dependencies, files, and directories. Okay, so in Docker container, you will have a read-only layer, read-write layer, int layer, and a, a group of read-only layer, which will be uni together to form a unified and a general view of your file system. That's the Docker image we're talking about. So this picture reminds us what happens if we replace the container runtime part here to hypervisor while keep, still keep using the Docker image. Yeah, that's a better idea, I think. So that's the hypercontainer project, which is fully open sourced, which is composed by three components. The first component is RunV. It is an OCI compatible hypervisor based runtime implementation, and it has a control daemon. It also has a neat service. So you can see here why I say um, hyper is a better implementation for pod, because first, it will have the lightweight virtual machine running as a pod, and then it will start your user containers inside of the pod, OK? And that's why we don't need to install a Docker daemon inside, because the hyper, the hyper start will be responsible to manage everything. And it is using the standard Docker image, and we also supported the OCI space image specification. So you can see here, there are some traits of hyper container here, like uh, service agility. It can be started within um, 500 milliseconds, and it has uh, good network performance, and uh, it has very small resource footprint because we are not using a full operating system inside. We use a minimum customized guest kernel, which is very, very small. And it has the same portability like Docker, and it is exactly have the same configurability like Docker because we are using the same API and command line like Docker. And uh, the most important thing is that Hype Container can give you the ability of hard hardware virtualization and independent kernel. It's very important, just like the virtual machine. I'd like to give you a very quick demo to prove that I'm not lying here. Okay, so this is a physical machine hosted in only package.net, so it, it's, it's nothing special if you check it here. It's a very normal machine. And uh, we can use hyper-CTO to see the status of the containers, the hyper-containers, which actually it, it is a lightweight virtual machine, and uh, we can just uh, run a hyper-container like this. It's very like uh, Docker, and uh, its API is very user-friendly. OK, so it's about uh, 600 milliseconds. It's very fast. It's a virtual machine. Please remember that. And we can also execute command inside of this pod, actually a lightweighted virtual machine, just like uh, Docker. That's why I say the configurability is very good for hypercontainer. OK, we are inside. We can see the file system, and uh, we can see the kernel version here. It's very different from the host machine, right? It's hyperkernel. It's a customized uh, special kernel we're using. And uh, we can also check the top command. You can see here, which is totally different from the host machine because it is fully isolated. It has its own proc file system. So that's hyper container. And uh, we also can do something, mm -hmm, I think, uh, dangerous here, like, uh, like a fork bump. You can run a fork bump inside this hyper container. That, that, and uh, your host machine will be, you know, um, still working. I will, I will give you the example, but please note, you should not do this in any kinds of uh, a Linux container like a Hyper or, or like a Docker or Rocket because it will damage your, your, um, your uh, host machine. So let's run a fork bomb inside this container, okay? So the container now is dead because the fork bomb have eat all the resources of the container, but if you do this thing in Docker, it will actually eat all the resources of your host machine. But on, on the other hand, this host machine is still alive. And we can also check the status of this dead container. It is still here. And we can just use our command line to delete it. OK, so that's all. That's the hype container. OK, let's move to the next slides. And uh, you can see here we have some uh, actually benefits of using hype container to run your applications. Uh, the most important thing is that it has the kernel features. It's very important because that's why you can run your legacy application inside. And the startup time is very fast, averages about five to uh, 600 milliseconds. And it's portable, like Docker. It has small memory footprint because it uses a very small, minimal guest kernel. And it has a very good configurability and have good network net performance. And it provides you with bankward compatibility. And what's more important, it gives you the ability to bring a mature and virtual, and virtual machine like security and isolation level to your system. Okay. 
So the next part is Hypernetis, which answers the question, how can we run your NFV workloads in Hypercontainer with Kubernetes? So that's the Hypernetis project, which is actually an um, upstream Kubernetes version with Hypercontainer at its runtime. Please note that Hyper is now an official container runtime since Kubernetes 1.6. It is integrated by using Frank T project. And on the other hand, we are using OpenStack to provide us with multi-tenant network and persistent volume. We are using standalone Kingston, Neutron, and Cinder here. We don't need to install any kinds of, of, of full version OpenStack. We don't need to do that because it's too complicated. Just standalone components is enough. OK. So let's begin from the container runtime. It's very simple. And uh, when talking about container runtime, we need to talk about the pod, which is the most important concept of Kubernetes. Actually, it is trying to help you to solve some uh, bad habits, actually. For example, some people like to use um, supervisor D to manage processes inside a container. But we all know that container is designed to run your one application in one container. That's the best model. So please use pod in this example. And uh, some people also trying to ensure the container order by using some hacky scripts. It's also wrong. You need to use a pod and init container. You need container to do that. I will give you an example about that. And uh, some people also trying to copy files from one container to another to share these files. It's also wrong. Please use a pod to solve that problem. And some people also trying to use, uh, trying to connect to its peer container through the whole network stand of your system. It's also wrong. Any kinds of this container which need to frankly com communicate with your other container through local host, you can just put them inside a, a pod because pod is a group of super affinity containers. Containers inside the same pod can communicate directly by using local host because they are sharing the same network namespace. And they also share the same volume. So you don't need to copy file from one to another. They just share the same volume here. So no need to do that. And it is just like a precise group in your container cloud. And that's why I say it's how hype container matched to Kubernetes philosophy. Because for example, if you want to create a pod which name is full with two containers inside, then according to the CI work workflow, it will first run post sandbox and start create and start container A and then create and start container B. So if you're using Docker runtime, it will create three containers for you because there will be an extra container which name is full, it's infra container, to hold the whole network namespace for you. So you will have three containers inside. But if you are using Hyper, Hyper will create you with a lightweighted virtual machine which name is full as a pod. And then it will create and start your user containers inside. So that's why you can see here, you, can, you have a physical pod running on your machine. Yeah, that's how Hyper matched to Kubernetes philosophy. OK, the next part is the multi-tenant network. The goal of this uh, part of work is to leverage a tenant of their neutral network in Kubernetes without breaking its model. And uh, the model of Kubernetes network is very easy to understand. So first of all, all pods in Kubernetes should be able to reach each other directly without NAT. And second, the NAT should also be able to reach every pod by using directly IP address without NAT. And all of this kind of communication should be able to based on IP address. OK, that's the Kubernetes network model. In order to implement this, we define a network object, which is a top level resource object in Kubernetes. And it maps to Kubernetes namespace by using one to n. And the key point is each tenant created through the Kingston will have its own network. And we also have a standalone network controller to manage the lifecycle of a network object. So the network here will be mapping to the neutral net object. OK. So as long as we have network, the, the, the next thing that helps to assign part to network. So um, the pods belong to the same network will reach other directly by using IP address. And uh, this is actually done by using Kubernetes. So we're going to the Kubernetes workflow. When you start up a pod in Kubernetes, it will actually call the setup pod in the network plugin, and it will send a gRPC request to a small daemon, which name is the kubistank. And it's the kubistank will be responsible to transfer your API to the standard neutron API we're using. And the responses from these API calls will be used to configure the pod virtual machine, actually. So it's very easy. And that's why we need the kubistank. But it's also responsible to handle the multi-tenant a service proxy. The reason I say so is because the default IP table best could be proxy is not tenant aware. For example, your pod and nodes can be isolated into different network in the multi-tenant environment. So that's why in Hypernetes, we have the building IPVS as a service load balancer in the pod. 
and it will be able to handle all the services updates in the same namespace. So there will be no network isolation here. And uh, we also follow the standard on-service update and on-endpoint update workflow in Kruby Proxy to make sure that all the services and the endpoints here will still keep update up to date. Okay, we also support the external load balancer, which, for example, you create a, a, a service which type is the network provider. We will call Neutron API to, sta to start an um, OpenStack LB for you to use here. Okay, so this network part. The last part is the processing volume, which is a little bit different from the volume we are using today. In Kubernetes, if you create a volume, the, it will have two steps. The first step is to attach the volume from your volume provider to a machine, to the host machine, and then it will bind mount this host path to your container. That's all, that's Kubernetes volume. But in Hyper, we don't need to do that because the Hyper virtual machine, the part here is actually a virtual machine based on hypervisor, so you can just directly attach a block device to this part. No need to attach first and bind mount, no need to do that. We support that, of course, but you don't, you don't, you don't need to do that because Attach a block device direct, directly will give you the better performance, actually. So you can see here, that's why we don't need to install a full version of OpenStack, because we don't need to use NOAA. We don't need to find where the node is to attach it. We just mount the block device directly to the pod. That's all. Okay, so if you create a persistent volume in Hypernetes, it's exactly the same like what you're doing with uh, the normal kind of volume. And just please remember to create a thinner volume beforehand and remember its ID. And then you just, you know, put YAML claim you want to use the thinner volume. That's all. Then our enhanced thinner volume plugin will be responsible for all the stuff to mount the, the block device to your um, pod. Okay, so this is a full topology of uh, Hypernetes project. It's quite simple. It is just a, a standard Kubernetes cluster running and with a hyper container as a runtime. And you, you will also need to install standalone Kingston, Neutron, and Stinder with safe RBD, for example. And you will also have the Neutron uh, L2 engine to running in every node. And you will have a Kubi stack running in every node. And uh, in master node, in master machine, you will have an extra network object. That's all. And the next, next goal of uh, Hypernetes project is want to make, th make things more uh, modular. For example, we will use a third-party resource to manage the network object we introduced here, and we will translate the uh, Kubi stack to a standard CNI plugin, and we will remove the so-called enhanced standard plugin because we, now we can just write a special plugin for block devices. It's special for Hyper, and in other cases, you can just use any volume plugin which is supported in Kubernetes, okay? So um, if you're interested in this project, please, please pay attention to the Hypernetes repo. And uh, we have a roadmap here. We are updating code there, so you can just um, pay attention to that. So let's back to the um, Clearwater demo. So as I said, Clearwater is composed by 10 components, which actually um, very complicated, you can see here. And what's Im more important is that every component in Clearwater, they just uh, trying to communicate with other components by using DNS name. That's why you can see here, we need to create a headless service for every component in Clearwater to make sure it has a special DNS name. And uh, although it looks like a little bit complicated, but deploy it to a Hypernetes project is super easy just by one command. I'll show you how it works because it's all based on the Hypernetes project and the Clearwater Docker deployment. So I have a small demo to introduce the things here. Okay, so um, just imagine you have already installed a Kubernetes cluster with standalone Yushun Kingston. You can check the scripts of in, in, in Hypernetes project how to do that. I will not demo it here. So as long as you have your Hypernetes project running, now you can just begin to log into the Clearwater project and then just run kubectl, create Kubernetes deployment. That's all. And after that, all the services and deployments will be created here, and you can check the post status, and you can see all the posts under creating. For example, if we define uh, two instances for Cassidra deployment, you will have two Cassidra posts creating here. It's very easy to understand, right? But there's still one thing I need to mention is about uh, the liveness prop. We define a liveness prop and readiness prop in every deployment in Clearwater because Clearwater is using a supervisor D to manage all your prestasis. So, it's, so unless the expected pod we are defi defining here becomes available, then the pod, then pod will become running. So we need to make sure that. 
So that's why we need to wait for a few, min for a few minutes. OK, so now let's check for the status of the pod to see if they're running. OK, it's 10 minutes later, it's become running. And that also means all the uh, applications inside a container are available. So that's why, for example, you can check uh, the status of a home state pod, for example, to, to see if it really works. Let's execute a command inside this pod, inside this container. It's very easy, just like you are in Docker. OK, so we log into the container. And then we can use the net state to check if the expected pods uh, is listening. OK, it works. And uh, we can also um, um, check to ch try to make sure that uh, this is running inside a lightweight virtual machine. For example, let's check the kernel version. Yeah, it's hyper container. And uh, we can also check the status of the top command, as I just showed you before. Yeah, it works. So that means this NFV deployment is fully running inside a small, lightweighted virtual machine built by a hyper container. So let's back to the um, um, clear, clear water project again. So now we can try to consume over clear water project. And by using its public IP, please notice that we need to, we need to assign a public IP to, to the clear water project. OK, it works. Now we need to sign up a user by using your um, favorite username and password. OK, so we'll see, escape the part. OK, so when we log inside the Clearwater, it will create an account for you. It's an SIP account. You, you can use it to make a phone call. So we need to now configure this account to a client. We are using an X client as a demo here. You can try other things. OK, let's configure the username and password inside the, uh, this um, X client software. It's very simple. and. Uh, we need to make, wait for a few seconds to, to wait for the account to become available. OK, it's become available. So that means the Clear Water project is functioning very well. Now we can just um, use it to make phone calls. So in order, in order to do that, we also need to uh, create another account. So we can just um, try to establish some phone call communication between these two accounts. So that's why we need another machine. And on this machine, we will again visit the portal IP of Clear Water project. And then we will, we can see the old account is here, right? And we, then we need to create another account by clicking this button. OK, so now we have two accounts. And then we need to configure this account to, uh, to, the, client, to the client on this machine. It's also an uh, X client software. OK, done. Let's wait for a few seconds. Come on, guys. Bad network. OK, our new account becomes available. Now we have two accounts running on two machines, right? So let's try to make a phone call, actually a video call, um, um, between these two accounts, a video call. OK, so let's wait for a few seconds to um, establish the connection. Uh, this actually depends on your network environment. I, I did this demo in, in, in China. So, OK, so now we have received a phone call from uh, the other machine, from the other peer. Let's answer it with your over uh, video. Let's wait for the uh, video being established. Come on, guys. Yeah, uh, so that's the video being established. That's uh, it's actually about we are using the Clearwater project to serve as a uh, IMA system, and we are establishing a video phone call between two machines by using by consuming our Clearwater project running in Kubernetes in Hypernetes project. Actually, it's fully open source. You can try it, try it out if you like it. Okay, so that's the main content of my demo, and. Um, Actually, during um, the process of deploying Clearwater to Hypernetes project, we also find there's something we need to learn from this, uh, from this kind of workflow. So the most important thing I need to mention is that we should never use uh, things like SuperWatherD or SystemD to manage multiple applications inside of one container. It's wrong. Don't do that. You can use a pod to do that. I'll give you a simple example here. The Clearwater project, for example, this, this pod actually has some auxiliary container running. It should be running, become running before all user containers. You can just define them as a so-called init container inside a pod. As the example shown here, for example, the Clearwater infra container and Clearwater SNMP container. You define them here, and they will be executed one by one precisely in right order before all the user containers defined below. 
So that's how we use containers inside a pod. And that's how we use pods to solve your complicated deployment. That's the core concept of microservices. Microservices is not talking about putting all things together into the container. That's wrong. You put everything into a single container, and you combine them into the, into the same pod if necessary. That's a microservice. OK, the next thing we learn is do not abuse DNS name. So the Clearwater project actually is using some uh, very weird DNS name, which is actually illegal in Kubernetes. So if you are trying to use DNS name, please remember you follow the standard rules of DNS name. For example, this is wrong, and it, it has been fixed in Clearwater upstream, luckily. And the next thing I need to mention is that if you are using Kubernetes, it's very important for you to remember that the liveness and the readiness check are really useful here. And the Clearwater is one of the best examples because it is using the SuperWater D to manage all the application processes inside a container. But the SuperWater D is always running. So you have no way to figure out whether your application is running or not. That's a problem, and that also happens in Java application. The Tomcat may be always running, but your application may be die. OK, so that's why we need the live list prob. And in this example, I defined a very simple script. It will periodically check the expected post if it is available, and only the pod can be connected by using TCP. It, then the pod will become running, become available. So that's the key point of the live list check um, in Kubernetes. And it also same with the readiness prop. It decides whether this pod can be used as a service backend or not. So that's a key point of using um, this kind of check in Kubernetes. OK, so this is the um, end of my speak. And I talk about uh, Kubernetes, talk about how to use Hyper uh, Container as a runtime in that project, talk about how to uh, install new chunking stone and Cinder in standalone mode to, pro to provide you with a multi-tenant and secure uh, functions in, the, in this Hypernetics project. And uh, I also have good news to share uh, is that uh, we have proposed the StackKubi project, which is, which is a new OpenStack Foundation project, which is fully originated from the Hypernetics project I'm talking today. So this is the end of my speak. Thank you very much. So do we, uh, we still have time for some QA. Do anyone have a question? Hello, uh, I'm Fu Chao from China Mobile. And uh, you know that when we are deploying multiple VNFs, uh, across, uh, a problem that actually stops us from using container is that uh, it is closely bounded to the host OS. So w w when we are really deploying these uh, VNFs, we're using the common host OS. And we will have multiple VNFs coming from all different vendors. Mm -hmm. uh, so. It, it, since the uh, container is closely bounded to the host OS, it make, uh, you, you have to have all the different vendors to uh, create their VNFs all based on the same host OS. Mm -hmm. And any one of them want to upgrade their VNF, they, they have to negotiate with the other VNF that actually running on the same right. host. So uh, th that is actually the, the things we will consider when we are talking about container. Uh, so I'm wondering if these uh, fancy things that you proposed here, whether it could solve this problem. Yeah, I think so. And that is what I'm talking about, the legacy application, actually. Because if you are using Hyper Container, it has an independent guest kernel, just like a normal virtual machine. So in this example, we are using our default kernel, which name is uh, Hyper Kernel. But you can also, you can even bring your own kernel, a full kernel. That also works. So that depends on you. If, if you found that your application can run on for example, old version of kernel, you can just uh, try to use that in, in, in Hyper Container. It's totally free. It's totally free. Hyper Container supports that. So I think it solves your problem. OK, sure. I will definitely follow this project and see. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was just wondering, how does uh, Hypercontainer compare with uh, unikernels? OK. Um, because there also, you try to have a minimal kernel mm -hmm. and try to make your or package your applications along with that minimalistic yep. kernel and make it work in an isolated environment. So how does it compare with unikernels? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, uh, unikernels and Hypercontainer is two different things, because you, the core idea of the unikernels is how to package your application with the operating system. 
So in order to run a unit kernel, you, you also need to use a hypervisor part. So that's a problem here. For hypercontainer, we actually did a lot of things to optimize the hypervisor part. That's why it can be started very fast. That's why it has a very small memory footprint. So um, this part, part of our work cannot be done in a unit kernel. So that's the first, first thing. And the second thing is that please remember that the most obstacle, most important obstacle people using unit kernel is that you need to learn how to package a unit kernel things, unit kernel stuff. It's not easy. It's not like a Docker image. So hyper container, however, is more like container. It's using Docker image, for example. So that's why I think uh, the unit kernel guys proposed the Linux kit project. The Linux kit is something similar to unit kernel, but it actually is using the normal way to build a customized kernel. So I think it's, it's, it has a much better user case than unit kernel. OK, so mm -hmm. thank you. Follow up is, uh, then in that case, can I use uh, Linux Kit instead? Uh, yes. Or, or how does it compare uh, hyper um, container uh, with, the, with the Linux Kit mm -hmm. assembled, let's say, uh, 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 yeah. runtime uh, yeah, uh, or, or, or yeah. uh, application packaged as a Linux Kit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you have mentioned the thing what we are doing today, and we are actually integrating Linux, Linux Kit as a minimum kernel inside a hyper container. So you will have hyper container running, but you, you have your ability to build the, your own kernel by using Linux Kit Toolkit. So that's what we are doing today. And then you'll have support for Mobi also. Uh, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's okay. what we are doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. then it makes portable. Okay, oh, thank okay. you. So I, I think it's time. Thank you very much for your interest in our project. Thank you.